Dr. Kaza mentioned, I'm a director of IVU Med based here in Salt Lake City. And being the only non-MD or PhD on the agenda, I get to talk about something uh, a little less exciting, a little less technical, a little less clinical. I'm going to talk about um, administrative concerns in administering um, global health projects. Um, this is based on some experiences we've had. One thing I don't want to do is focus just on the challenges and things that can go wrong in a project. I want to also offer up some things that go well and uh, things that can be accomplished by pooling resources. That's also a really useful slide if you're expecting a child. You can save your back. Um, also a caveat though, um, this is based on a relatively small sample. Um, we have been doing this for nearly 20 years, I'll get to that shortly, but um, I wanted to compare a couple surgical initiatives that are very similar, but again it's only two, so not terribly universal, but the s initiatives were so similar that it makes for a valid comparison. Uh, one thing I wanted to start with, uh, it's been um, addressed slightly here, but kind of the, the mindset of the larger um, public health, global health organizations, and a lot of the focus has been guided by Millennium Development Goals, uh, maybe four, five, and six, talking about child mortality, maternal health, and infectious disease, and so there's often not a lot of room in that mindset for surgery. So a lot of these groups are doing this work, they've got their community health workers, they've got their initiative, they've got their focus on HIV and some and malaria, some large problems, but they don't really have, even though they're larger, they have a lot of funding, a lot of experience, they don't necessarily have much experience in surgery. And when they start to incorporate a surgical component into their programs, this can cause some friction. Now, surgery specifically, as you all know, of course, has special logistics that aren't necessarily present in other programs. Um, staffing is obviously uh, key. You need to have people with the right expertise. You need to have the right facilities and supplies. And you need to incorporate the right partners, people who have experience in this area. And helping raise awareness of the importance of surgery. Now, when you start to become aware of surgery and how much need there is, of, so we've talked about so far today, and how much goes into it, it can seem overwhelming. But it ha there's enormous potential, especially if the programs are carried out in I don't want to use the word to offend Dr. Harris, but in a sustainable manner so we can you know, get more bang for our buck. Now surgery and the global burden of disease, we all know that it's much more prevalent than people are aware of. Um, estimates range from 11% and upward of uh, conditions that can be treated with surgery. Getting more specifically uh, into what we do, urology in global surgery has a high prevalence and unlike some conditions like um, cleft lip and palate or trauma, Urology is often, um, the incidence is even less known because it's so private in nature. And this private nature can lead to a lot of psychological trauma for patients. Um, it can be very hard for the families and something is just not talked about. Now IVU Med, um, give some background about our organization to give more um, background about the initiatives. It's not just a shameless plug for our organization, but who are we kidding? IVU Med uh, was uh, a teaching organization. Our motto is Teach One, Reach Many, um, with the mission of making urological care more widely available worldwide. We were founded in 1995 after beginning work in uh, 1992 with some other organizations, Interplast specifically. It's the only NGO dedicated to teaching urology specifically in uh, resource limited parts of the world, and we've got programs throughout much of the developing world. Now we keep busy, we do 15 to 25 surgical programs per year. Um, thousands of patients have been served through these programs. And we've got scholarship programs serving over 150 scholars based in North America that have gone out and experienced urology in resource limited settings. And we've been working in over 30 countries in that 20 year span. Just to give you an idea of some of the programs we've worked on, uh, we started out in pediatric urology and we branched out pretty much the full gamut of urology that can be implemented in a resource limited setting. So shy of robots, we've, we've gone through reconstruction, women's uh, pelvic floor, and most urological subspecialties. Now getting back to global health initiatives, um, plugging this in, the surgical mindset, or the surgical um, logistics and urology specifically, into uh, initiative run by groups that have little experience with surgery, and per particularly with urology, it can be difficult and there um, can be some hurdles to overcome. Some general barriers to successful programs mostly have been discussed so far today. Talking about resources, getting the right equipment and supplies in the right place, getting the right personnel to work with, making sure everyone's on the same page um, in terms of pre and post-operative care, 
There are going to be political barriers in terms of uh, lasting programs. We try to, you know, we, IVU Med makes multi-year commitments to the sites in which we work. So um, the political environment definitely is a consideration to, to take in, keep in mind when starting up a program. And cultural uh, issues like uh, Dr. Wiesner discussed earlier. But also there's the development mindset. We've got our own culture within the global health, within the international development community where we think we've got the answers. And a lot of times we can fall into a kind of a groupthink mindset where we, you know, this certain area of public health is, you know, in right now. So we're focusing on that and we've got these solutions. We're going to implement those and that can get us thinking inside that box. And also partnerships can be an issue. We've all got our ways of doing things. We've got our 20 years of doing something. Another organization might have their 30 years of doing something and they've refined their approach. They do it a certain way. And so when we try to work together, that can be difficult. Um, I don't know if many of you read Paul Collier's book, The Bottom Billion, but there's an example he briefly cites there in which three NGOs independently decided to build a hospital. They each wanted to build a hospital in the same community in Sub-Saharan Africa. And eventually they all learned that the other groups were thinking the same thing. So they decided, well, let's work together. You know, there's no sense in us building three hospitals. So that's a great first step. They decided to work together. But then it got a little more complicated. They all had their own protocols for how they build a hospital, how they do things, all the administration. And it took them two years to find a way to work together. So after two years of back and forth, they finally got together. They're going to pool their resources and build a hospital. And the solution they came up with was that each of the three NGOs would build one floor of the hospital. So hospital number one comes in with their protocols. They build the first floor. Then the next one comes in. and then. If the third one's still around, they'll, they'll put on the roof or something like that. So, you know, sometimes it, it doesn't work very well working together. But sometimes it does. And uh, comparing two projects, um, these are both similar programs, a surgical program for the prevention of HIV. One was kind of a runoff of one of those programs. Um, both of them had a single country project implementation. They were confined to a relatively small area. Um, project A had multiple decision-making stakeholders, a lot of large, global health groups coming together on this initiative. And Project B had one administrative group. Both had multiple project implementers, people on the ground carrying out the project. And then Project A was a subcontract to the surgical NGO through another organization, which is contracted through another organization. IBU Med was the surgical contractor. And Project B was a primary contract directly from the decision makers directly to IBU Med, the surgical NGO. Now, uh, I just want to point out and stop that um, both of these programs were successful. They both met their objectives. And this is not to say that one project is going to accomplish more. It's just a matter of cost effectiveness and efficiency and translating down to affordability. Just to look at the communication, it's a little hard to see on there. But Project A, there's the, the organizational chart, starting with the planners up top, several levels of uh, subcontractors, and then the implementers on the ground. The names of the innocent have been covered. The not so innocent, I think I left on there. And uh, Project B, you had the supervising organization issuing the contract. You had on-site logistical people helping with site visits and rounding up patients and going through the local regulations. And then you had the surgical NGO, IVU Med. In terms of implementation, both projects had their planning meetings. Of course, you need to coordinate. Uh, Project B had a site visit. We had somebody on the ground to take a look at the hospital. Project A had site visits. And we were told um, by uh, Dr. Krauser, if we did a site visit of our own, just don't call it a site visit because people on the ground might get a little upset with more people coming to look at things. And so Project A had the direct line of communication. Project B had a lot of levels of communication. And what happened was the, all these groups coming together, similar to the hospital story, they were constantly changing strategies, adapting the things on the ground, which is good, trying to make the program responsive. But at the same time, we had so many people discussing it that there were a lot of delays. And that's when the friction with a surgical program comes into place because surgeons can't just pick up you know, and go next month to, because that's when they've decided on the new dates for this initiative. We're working with people who need several months just to be able to clear the schedule so they can go. So you've got people on the ground waiting for instructions. You have people just waiting to ship out, find the dates. And without this long communication chain, all these delays, people waiting, the people on the ground can start to feel like they're missing some important information that can help them do their jobs more effectively. This is from a greeting card I found back in college. I 
bought about a dozen of them, gave them to everybody I know for birthdays, and then they stopped inviting me to their parties. Uh, but it served a good purpose then, too. Um, strengths of the projects, again, I mentioned there were strengths to both. Project uh, A had a really good site. It was chosen as a small contained area as a project site or a pilot program so it could be modeled in other areas. It was well controlled, well planned. There was broad support. That's one good thing about a program that's got so many stakeholders is a lot of people support the program. And there's a, that can help increase awareness and you know, funding obviously will be, will be greater. And uh, Project B, again, I mentioned is nimble in terms of planning and, and implementation. And both projects uh, were successful in terms of outcome. Both of them exceeded their goals. They performed more surgeries than they had planned. So both of them went well. But just looking at cost effectiveness, because of all the additional administrative time, just at the surgical NGO level, um, the delays of extra communication almost doubled the cost, the administrative cost of the program. Um, so recommendations from this comparison, one is the greater inclusion of the specialty organization, specialty partners within the, the initiative. Not necessarily a place at the table equal to all the funders and the, the project managers, which would be ideal, but at least uh, communication up front early is to try to educate those other stakeholders about the, the special considerations involved in a surgical project. And also greater inclusion of local partners. Our organization focuses on training. We try to bring in as many people from the area. And uh, one project on uh, flying people in from the US to do relatively simple surgeon, surgery when there are plenty of African surgeons on the continent that could have done the surgeons them, su surgeries themselves, just doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of administration and cost effectiveness and capacity building. But there are also lessons for the, the specialty NGOs. Uh, we don't have it all figured out. Um, one thing is we need to learn the process. Uh, small organizations like us, um, we, or surgical organizations in general, if we're going to be working in these initiatives with these large collaboratives, we just need to learn the process and, and be able to uh, be aware of the fact that we do need to communicate these considerations early on in the process and also communicate internally with our stakeholders so that they understand the process and the inherent delays. Just to look uh, briefly at some of our other partnerships that we've engaged in that kind of follow this model. I've you met who works with uh, regional surgical associations like COSEXA, like Dr. Matlack discussed, and um, they draw up their needs, they issue a contract they say, we've got this surgical uh, curriculum. We've got a urological component. We'd like you to help us draw it up and help teach that. And so they issue a contract directly to us. It's a very efficient process, and it's a way to help um, build a long-lasting program through education and professional exchange. Uh, additional observation. This was mentioned before, so I'll just go over this really quickly. Uh, in terms of service orientation and also incorporating the capacity building educational component. Uh, international volunteerism, obviously we mentioned the short-term impact and there's also the potential for dependency. And then capacity building programs, there's the sustainability word at the bottom. I think I met my quota in saying that, so I'll wrap it up shortly. But uh, when these programs, when teaching is involved, um, there really is a lasting impact. If you look at this program from southern Vietnam, uh, there's virtually no pediatric urology when this program began in 1994. Now they're doing nearly 1,000 cases a day. So when we start working as surgical organizations with those who have um, expertise in other areas, they've got you know, usually broad support, and a lot of expertise working on the ground, but we need to make sure communication is an important component of the project so we can relay our needs early on in the process to help ensure that the program is more successful and also more cost effective and efficient. Thank you.